harvest the cane. Here's to the people who harvest the cane. Here's to the people who harvest the cane. Who work in the sun and the wind and the rain. From all round Australia and all round the world. To the land of the sunshine, they come here to work. You know, you don't have to be a farmer to love this time of the year. They're cutting cane. All along the coast, from the Daintree River to the Clarence, you can smell the sugar in the air. Australia's got over 30 million tonnes of sugar cane to harvest in less than six months. The only way we can do it is with big machines like this. The juice the sugar mills squeeze out of the cane makes us the world's largest exporter of raw sugar. Pretty impressive, don't you think? These days, we take this sort of thing for granted. But some of us still remember what it was like when you had to do everything by hand. The old timers had to cut the green cane and load heavy bundles of cane stalks onto wagons, all by themselves. Now that was hard work. Today's youngsters don't know how lucky they are. After a while, people started burning the cane first. That made it a lot easier to cut, but it was still hot, dirty, mm, back-breaking work. You had to be tough, I can tell you. Today, machines like this Ostoft make it look real easy. They can cut more cane in an hour than blokes like me could do in a week. No wonder Ostoft is the world leader in making sugarcane harvesters. Most of the world's machines are made right here in Bundaberg. Makes you feel proud. Australians have been designing mechanical cane harvesters for 100 years. We seem to have a natural talent for it. Just ask the blokes at Ostoft. How we got to be the world's best in this business makes an interesting story. Tell you what, hang around for a bit and I'll tell you about it. If you've ever had to cut cane all day and load the bundles onto trucks in the blazing sun, mechanical harvesting soon sounds like a very good idea. That's probably why we started experimenting with harvesters a hundred years ago. It's not as easy as you might think to invent a machine that cuts and loads sugar cane. A lot of obstacles had to be overcome before everyone could switch over to this new way of harvesting. Even when the inventors did come up with a good system, it didn't catch on straight away. For a while, it looked like it might never happen. But that didn't stop those early inventors. They just kept plugging away until they succeeded. Those inventors were a rare breed, all right. They'd rather weld a piece of steel than have a good feed or a cold beer. They'd spend every spare moment working on their machines looking for ways to make them work better, or sometimes to make them work at all. Some people said you had to be half crazy to try to build a machine that had cut and load sugar cane. Everyone knew it wouldn't work, but somehow those crazy characters just kept going along. And wouldn't you know it, eventually they proved the skeptics wrong. Late last century, when our industry was just beginning to grow, the cane planters produced their crops with the help of Pacific Islanders. They used to call them Kanakas. For 40 years or so, those islanders helped keep our industry expanding. One year, there were 13,000 Kanakas working in the fields. Then, in the early 1900s, when Australia became a new nation, the Kanakas were sent back to their island homes. Gangs of men of European descent took over in the cane fields. The prophets of doom reckoned the industry had died, but it didn't. It just kept growing through good times and bad. And look what it is today. Like I said, those early hand cutters used to cut the cane green. Just like a lot of farmers do today. We got pretty good at cutting cane. Soon we were the world's best. 
We were always looking for new ways to make the job easier. Still are. During World War II, labour became very scarce and crops were getting larger. After the war, refugees from Europe helped with the harvest and we brought in shiploads of migrant workers from Italy. But there still weren't enough cutters to do the job. Mechanical harvesters started to look better and better. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to the beginning. Like I said, Australians have been making cane harvesters for over a hundred years. According to the patent records, the first design for a cane harvester was made in 1888. An engineer bloke down Brisbane Way called Thomas Tomlinson came up with a handy sort of design. His idea was for horses to pull a machine on a cable up and down the cane rows. Most of the early cane harvesters were very primitive, not much like today's sophisticated machines, but they worked. Well, some did, and the others might have too, with a bit of luck. We don't know how many of those early designs got off the drawing board and into the field. Most were a bit radical for the time. Even if they got built, they probably didn't cut much cane. But that didn't stop other people from trying. According to the newspapers, the first cane harvester ever built was in 1890. A fellow called John Rowland was reported to have built a steam-powered machine 27 metres long. That's more than twice as long as today's machines. Rowland was the mayor of Bundaberg at the time. Interesting when you think about it, because Bundaberg was later to become the world centre of cane harvester manufacturing. Today, we can have a good laugh at those first cane harvesters. But strange contraptions weren't restricted to the early days. In the early 1900s, several inventors tried unsuccessfully to promote the idea of using electrical handheld cutters. Fifty years later, a similar device reappeared, but it didn't work either. A lot of inventors went broke making cane harvesters, so why did they keep trying? Partly because they'd been bitten by the inventing bug, but mainly because cane farmers wanted a faster, easier, cheaper way of cutting and loading their crops. Would-be inventors kept coming up with new ideas. Finally, they found one that worked to everyone's satisfaction. Well, nearly everyone. There was always someone who figured he had a better idea. Cutting cane at ground level was never the problem. The hard part was picking it up again. People were using primitive cane loaders before the turn of the last century, like this one at Innisfail. And even in the 1920s, Falconer used a tractor-mounted mechanical loader. Around the same time, Howard incorporated the new loading system into his whole stick harvester. In the 1940s, Fairy Mead Sugar Company used jib-type loaders to load cane on its Bundaberg plantations. Tofts had a loader too. Later they built one for cane growers that was powered by hydraulics. That was an exciting development. But it wasn't until we came up with specialised front-end loaders in the 1950s that we made real headway in mechanical loading. The Quaid front-end loader was a big breakthrough. It meant that even the little battler like me could afford to buy one. We could load cane which had been cut by hand as well as that cut by whole stalk harvesters. Front-end loaders gave a real boost to machine harvesting. Soon they'd virtually replaced hand loading. But with whole stick cutting we still had to solve the problem of removing the cane tops before loading. Most cane harvesters had toppers but there still weren't too many harvesters about. Most cane was still cut by hand and the tops had to be removed while the stalks were lying on the ground. Oh, my aching back. Then someone came up with the idea of a mechanical topper. For a while they were very popular, especially at Mackay, where a lot of small farms still cut cane by hand. Eventually the industry switched over to harvesters that could feed the cane straight onto transport. No more lifting. But I'm getting ahead of myself again. The thing to remember about mechanical harvesting is you've got to have a system that'll work everywhere. 
In the early days, plenty of machines could cut in good conditions. Straight cane, flat ground, dry weather. But we really needed a universal harvester. One that could handle cane tangled like spaghetti. A machine that could plough through boggy paddocks. That was the challenge. We didn't make much headway towards that goal until the late 1920s, even though machines were still being developed. Bundaberg Sugar Millers sponsored the Howcroft Sleeping Giant. Nambour had the Cantle Cutter, a machine which used a sledgehammer to drive a sharp blade into the cone. And Mackay had the Miller Owen. None of them was very successful. A little bit later, people like Hurry, Faulkner and Howard arrived on the scene. Their ideas were more practical. Howard was the man who invented the rotavator tiller. But after a while, even he gave up on cane harvesters. Of all the early inventors, Ralph Faulkner was the most successful. He was part sheep breeder, part inventor, part city businessman and 100% entrepreneur. 70 years ago, Faulkner perfected a whole stalk cane cutting system which might have revolutionised the Queensland sugar industry. You know, even way back then there was a lot of interest in mechanical harvesting. Important sugar people put money into Faulkner's company. But times were tough when the company went broke. Damn shame, really. But Faulkner wasn't the sort to give up easily. He went to Cuba, and there he tested the world's first chopper-type cane harvesters, both single and double row versions. In Florida in the early 1930s, 14 of Faulkner's single row chopper machines built in Milwaukee cut over 200,000 tonnes in three seasons. That was a lot of cane in those days. Eventually, the Big Depression killed off the project and Faulkner's dream died with it. But he certainly showed what could be done. A lot of inventors were like Faulkner, ahead of their time. Nearly 40 years later, the rusting bones of Faulkner's machines could still be seen in the Florida Everglades. Silent monuments to the achievements of this great Australian inventor. Today's cane harvesters are based on a similar principle to that used by Faulkner. But it did take us a long time to get back to that concept. 30 years later, Faulkner's ideas were resurrected at Mackay by Larry Maloney in a machine he built for the Krieber brothers. About the same time, Ken Gaunt of Massey Ferguson adopted a similar approach on a commercial scale. And that opened a whole new era of mechanical harvesting. But before that happened, cane growers in the 1940s spent a lot of time using a different, more primitive method. Now they used simple shear blades and rotating ground blades to cut whole stalks of cane. Shear blades were cheap and easy to operate, although the work was hard. And heavy bundles of cane still had to be lifted by hand off the ground and onto trucks. It was inevitable that people would look for quicker, easier ways of loading. In the 1930s and early 1940s, Fairy Mead Sugar Company were virtually the only ones doing much mechanical harvesting. Fairy Mead, now Bundaberg Sugar, built its own machines and used them to cut cane on its big plantations for crushing in its own sugar mills. Over the years, Charlie Young and his team at Fairy Mead came up with plenty of different models both single row and double row. They were ugly brutes, I tell you. But they were very effective. Unfortunately, not very suitable for small farmers like me. One of the few inventors in the early 1940s was Larry Maloney up at Mackay, the same fellow who later built the chopper machine for creepers. Maloney's first harvester was a wooden sled affair. It was pulled by horses. Later, he made one out of bush saplings, held together by bolts and wire. Larry Maloney became the most successful commercial manufacturer since Faulkner. No single family made a bigger contribution to cane harvesting than the Tofts of Bundaberg. In 1940, the Toft family built a mechanical loader and then a harvester. 
They went from being small, struggling farmers to successful international businessmen. Later, two of the Toft brothers, Harold and Colin, harnessed the magic of hydraulics. Those boys from the bush built a revolutionary cane loader which could be fitted onto a truck or a tractor. When it came to machinery, Harold Toft was a real genius. And Colin Toft, ha <laughs> well, he could sell fridges to Eskimos. Together, they developed a company which was to become the world's biggest designer and manufacturer of cane harvesters and transporters. Toft Brothers built countless machines over the years, sold them all around the world, and of course, Tofts eventually became Ostoft, the public company that now dominates the world market. After World War II, when labour was very scarce, new ideas were being developed all the time. Mechanical harvesting really took off in the 1960s. By early 1960, the big question was, should the industry continue with the whole stick harvesters which had proved so popular for so many years? Or should we swing over to the new chopped cane machines that were starting to appear? The big international farm machinery manufacturer Massey Ferguson had got in on the act. They developed a commercial chopper harvester at about the same time as Maloney was reviewing the Faulkner system for Creeper Brothers. Massey's approach eventually caught on, especially in the wet north where the gang system of hand cutters operated. As Massey Ferguson captured more of the market, they fought tooth and nail with Toft Brothers. It was a great time for harvester inventors. But it wasn't just Toft and Massey. There were other small manufacturers too. Many Queenslanders are part of the harvesting legend. There are too many inventors to mention them all by name. But ones that do come to mind readily include Bill Crichton, Ray Benton, the Scott brothers, Lawrence Mizzy, no, oh, and his brother Joe Mizzy as well, and the Canavans. History also recalls names like Kinnear, Harry. There was Truscott. Oh yes, and Bunnell. And Rasmussen. What about Hodge? That Lindemann fella. Oh, and Kenielsen as well. When it came to promoting mechanical harvesting, the growers' own organisation was always out front. Cane growers helped set up a combined industry and government committee to push mechanisation. The Mechanical Harvesting Committee looked at new machines and encouraged inventors to develop their ideas. Some inventors got financial help, <laughs> some didn't. In the end, it probably didn't make too much difference whether the committee helped or not. If you were crazy enough to build a cane harvester, you were going to do it, even if you had to spend your own money. At one stage, the committee brought a J&L machine from Louisiana to show our blokes what the Yanks were doing. Even though Australians invented cane harvesters before the Americans, they were quicker to use them commercially. Queensland Mechanical Harvesting Committee sent a travelling circus down the coast to demonstrate the J&L. It attracted some big crowds too, wherever it went. But the J&L wasn't the answer to our problems. In the end, our blokes had to do it on their own. And they did. Looking back, it was the people who made all the difference. Their courage and hard work turned the dream into a reality. Their determination and perseverance overcame hardships, disappointments and frustration. Inventing was like a disease. It could hit anyone. And when you had it, it was very hard to get rid of it. It wasn't always the qualified ones who made the big discoveries. Plenty of good ideas came out of farm sheds and bush workshops. We've still got a few inventors out there on our farms. A few people who are crazy enough to take up the challenge. Anyway, half crazy or not, I salute them all. Every Australian can be proud of what those men and women achieved. They all played an important part in making Australia the world leader in cane harvesting. We were the first country in the world to convert entirely to mechanical harvesting. And now, we're the world's number one raw sugar exporter. Yep, 
I just love this time of year. Here's to the people who harvest the cane, who work in the sun and the wind and the rain. From all round Australia and all round the world, to the land of the sunshine, they come here. 